Hello and welcome to COVID Conversations here on WNCU 90.7 FM. I'm your host, Kimberly Pierce Cartwright. I'm the News and Public Affairs Director here at WNCU. And we're using the Zoom platform to talk about how COVID-19 is affecting our world. And I have the very good pleasure of having with me today, Dr. Wanda Boone. She's the founder and executive director of a nonprofit in Durham called Together for Resilient Youth. And she's been doing that since about 2002. She's an expert in things related to strategies, prevention framework, trauma, um, resilience, and disparities. Hello, Dr. Boone, and how are you today? Hello, I'm doing just fine. How are you? It's good to be here. Oh, my goodness. I, I looked through your information on your website about Durham Tri, and I have, have got so many questions mm-hmm. about um, COVID-19, but all the other wonderful things that, that, that you do. So first of all, what is TRI for my audience? Mm -hmm. So Together for Resilient Youth is a coalition of coalitions. And what I mean by that is we have several different sectors, not only around the table, but also that reach out in the community. So we have youth ages seven to uh, nine to 17, young adults ages 18 to 24. And then we have businesses, law enforcement, health, um, schools, parents, and unfortunately parents that have lost children due to overdose. And that is the vehicle that we use to prevent whatever we need to prevent. So coalition of coalitions, everybody's invited. And so that's what Together for Resilient Youth is. Amazing. Can we talk about your grassroots work with COVID-19 inside of all of this partnership? Yes, absolutely. And really, it's the collaborative kind of effort that makes this work. So I may be the face of Together for Resilient Youth or TRI, but it's really all of the individuals that reach out to their stakeholder groups that I just mentioned that help to inform how we responded and respond to COVID-19 variants and um, vaccines. So young people talk to young people, young adults talk to young adults and that kind of thing. So we um, uh, use education, specific messaging around those stakeholder groups because not everybody listens to everybody. But when we engage stakeholders that reach out to their areas of influence, then we widen our reach and also reach more people at the grassroots level that can influence, not coerce, but influence people to be more engaged in terms of getting the vaccine or hearing more about COVID. So when you talk about grassroots, so Mm -hmm. where are these places that you're going to to meet these people that you're you're bringing this information to? Yes, so um, this outreach really specifically has to do with um, Black people and Hispanic people. And so we are out in districts one and four, which are the communities of most color in Durham. So we have community health workers, 10 of them, who reach out to communities, people, neighborhoods, barbershops, nail salons, and recently, I don't go there, maybe I should, but the eyebrow places, <laughs> the threading places, um, in order to reach people where they are and where they live, play and work. Um, and so it's not scattershot, but it actually is meeting people where they are and having relational conversations with individuals in addition to having vaccine clinics. So, so these are, are underserved communities where you're going and doing doing this this feet on the ground or boots on the ground work? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But keeping in mind that uh, being black is not a monolith. So we actually speak to everyone uh, wherever they are. So senior citizens that live in older neighborhoods in Durham sometimes get left out because, you know, we're thinking about going to um, public housing communities, which we do. But then we have people that live all over Durham that are hesitant about vaccines. And so we reach them 
uh, where they are using community health workers that, um, that they are accustomed to seeing uh, in their uh, neighborhoods. Okay. When you, when you talk to people about getting vaccinated, tell me, doctor, what, what are some of the reasons why people say, well, I'm not going to get the vaccine? Yeah. Yeah. So the most, the, the most, um, uh, the one thing that we hear the most has to do with uh, the kinds of experiments that were done um, you know, back in the day with uh, Tuskegee and that kind of thing. And what we need to understand is, and what I say to people is, that these individuals did not have a choice. Their bodies were used without their permission or consent. And with the COVID vaccine, the research that was done in order to make sure that vaccines are safe and that kind of thing, um, people volunteered they volunteered in order to go through clinical trials. Some got the vaccine and some got what's called a placebo or non-vaccine. And then, you know, to test and see how that felt worked out and how well it worked against the coronavirus. And so that's the biggest difference that people need to understand. Um, the other thing that I say is, um, to, to talk to people and we present people who have had the vaccine. So for example, I didn't expect this to be so popular and it was. And so after I got my vaccine, I went on Facebook and I did an hour by hour of how I was feeling, including the negative part of how I felt. So yes, I had pain in my arm. Uh, yes, I was very tired. Uh, for one day, I had a slight headache, but I don't have to worry about getting on a ventilator, you know, and, and that's the trade-off. So then more people responded, oh, well, if you did it, I can do it. And then they posted information about how they felt. My husband felt nothing the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and so, you know, that was real important as well. So I, I I would not be that brave to go on Facebook or, or Instagram or anywhere else to tell people how I was feeling. So that, that to me, that is just very, very interesting that you would take that approach. Mm -hmm. Next question for you, Dr. Boone, is besides um, education, what are you providing in the community? Uh, PPE or what yes. you show up, what are you bringing? So when the CHWs show up or when I show up, we come with lots of things. We come with information about grief. We come with information about stress and trauma and resilience and how to calm down. We come with information for children um, about how the vaccine helps their parent or grandparent. And we come with face masks and sanitizer and things to clean up around the house. We come with uh, fresh produce that is uh, supplied by black farmers. And we're excited about that produce boxes. Um, the other thing that we do, which worked really well, is to provide coupons for a next visit uh, off, get money off, for um, barbershops and salons. So $25 coupons that when a person gets their vaccine, they can come back again during the month in order to get $25 off of whatever service they have. That worked really well. Oh. So, um, you know, so, so we do things like that as well. So I, I guess it sounds like to me that you're just finding people where they are and in whatever mindset they are in about whether or not they're going to get the vaccine. Right, right, because there's so many things that people are struggling with in this whole COVID dynamic until if we just talk about COVID and not meet some of the other needs, then that's not going to help as much as we want it to. And then, you know, they're the underlying conditions that cause black people to be more susceptible and immune systems are uh, not functioning at full capacity um, as other races. And that has to be addressed too. And so we have conversations because people are afraid. 
You know, they're worried about their children. And that's why we provide information about stress um, and talk about it. And then they have loved ones that have passed away. And it, they tried to kind of push that aside and like, well, that was them, but maybe that won't happen with me. But the pain and grief of losing 600,000 people across the United States, and many times it's happened in our own families. So uh, you come and you give the information and I'm sure there are some people who say, I don't care what you say, I'm not getting the virus. So what is the strategy that you use to work with people who still say, I don't wanna get vaccinated to try to turn them a little bit more towards taking the vaccine? Mm -hmm. So for me, and as I've talked to our CHWs, it's about relationship. No one is convinced of anything usually on the first attempt, if you will. And so we come back and see if there are other questions. We hold town halls, we hold conversations in communities, we hold conversations in barbershops and salons and um, you know that kind of thing. And so, you know, although we want to rush to get people vaccinated, it's going to take time. And so we continue to go back, not saying you got vaccinated yet. <laughs> you know, we don't do that. But but we say, do you have more questions? And then we talk about the variant. We talk about this, not only with medical professionals, which sadly, medical professionals are not really trusted now. It's a, it's a very sad thing, but that may have to do with uh, institutional bias as well. But anyway, um, and so we talk about uh, this in layman's terms, like when the coronavirus is out there, it seeks a body to invade. And when it comes in through your nose and your mouth, which is why you should wear a mask, then it latches on to the lungs, the brain, the kidneys, and it, it literally latches on with suction cups and says, I'm not leaving here. I'm not, I'm not leaving here until I feel like it. And some get released back out and people do okay, but others, the virus literally takes over these organs and they don't recover. So the best thing to do is not have that scary image in mind and make sure that you protect yourself with a mask and then become vaccinated when you can. So are you running into people who are getting their information about COVID-19 from Facebook? And if you are, even if you aren't, you may have um, thought about the situation where people were getting their information and misinformation. And how are you, how are you combating that speak about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for asking that um, because we do post information on social media, um, not just information from the CDC, but information that looks like what would grab the attention of an individual or individuals. And I don't wanna take up too much time on this, but for example, our most popular um, ad or Facebook post was of a gentleman who had on a t-shirt, black uh, gentleman, and he had, you know, big muscles. I mean, you know, I've been married for 50 years, so I wasn't looking that close. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but anyway and, so, <laughs> and so he had a mask on and he had a mask that was held out like this. And so the ad said, you know, um, I'm looking for a man that has a mask on and then one to give to his beloved mother. <laughs> so, and so that was one that was really, really, really popular. So um, it's not that we wanna be so humorous about it, but if it grabs the attention of one person, then it can grab the attention of another. So can, can we talk about like some numbers yeah. and how you are having like impact on people that you're trying to serve and then trying to reach people who you might be able to convince to get a vaccine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's so many events that are happening all over Durham. Um, and some of the larger events uh, reach out to 400 people in terms of getting vaccinated. Um, our events are smaller and um, more intimate. 
So for example, we had an event at Bethesda Elementary School um, last weekend. And so <clears throat> we decided that we wanted to have 50 vaccines available, five zero. And you know, that, that's it. So people came in, we were able to have conversations. Some people came with their families, family members got vaccinated, other family members didn't want to, and not through coercion, but asking, well, what, what are your concerns about getting vaccinated? And answering those questions, taking time with people while they're sitting and waiting for their vaccination, not being intrusive, uh, you know, can I talk to you? <laughs> you know, just not going up to people. And, and so there were some young people and some older people who decided to get vaccinated right then and there. So, I, and so that was 50 um, at that particular event. We've had 25, 50, 60, 55, you know, so a hundred, less than a hundred is where we, where we find our pocket to be, if you will. And so over the past, I don't want to exaggerate, but um, just with our efforts in those smaller ways, I would say that since, oh, since July, um, we've probably encouraged um, over 200 people to be vaccinated. But you add that to the others that are, you know, doing other things and every, every bit helps. Would you mention some of your partners for me? Yes. So our partners are North Carolina Central University, um, Duke University. Um, then we have Peach and La Samia, Care. I'm going to leave somebody out. But uh, we have lots of partners. Uh, the African American COVID Task Force uh, is, a, is a wonderful partner. And then we have partners that are parts of schools and recreation centers and health department, of course. And so we couldn't do what we do without them. Dr. Boone, thank you. And good luck with all of your efforts. Thank you. About the vaccine. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Have a great day. Yes. And thank you, audience, for watching via YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, as well as listening to WNCU 90.7 FM. Be sure to like us. We want you to follow us and subscribe to our pages to see more of our archive shows. I'm Kimberly Pierce Cartwright, your host for COVID Conversations. We'll see you next time.